In 1989, a man called Bob Lazar walked into a Las Vegas TV station and gave a remarkable interview. He said that he'd worked out in the Nevada desert at a top secret facility known as Area 51. He said he worked on a highly classified project, reverse engineering recovered alien spacecraft. His story was a worldwide sensation, and Area 51 became a household name, synonymous with UFOs, secret projects, and little green men. And yet, neither the US government nor its military have ever denied his claims, and they still don't officially confirm that Area 51 exists, despite satellite photos proving it does. Many dismiss Bob Lazar as a fantasist, and yet others see him as a whistleblower, exposing a government cover-up of UFOs and alien contact. A once secret air base in the Nevada desert is marking an unofficial anniversary today. <laughs> Area 51 was one of the most secretive places on the planet, but that anonymity vanished forever because of what happened 25 years ago. A controversial electronics whiz told a fantastic tale during a TV interview, and the story still reverberates today. The I team's George Knapp played a part in what became an international sensation. He's here with an update. Uh, setting the stage, Dave, you might not know this, but 25 years ago, a young anchor woman <laughs> named Paula Francis and I were prepping for the five o'clock news when we learned that our scheduled live interview had canceled we placed a call to aviator john lear to ask if he could get a friend of his to fill the spot a guy who reportedly worked out near area 51 and had seen flying saucers out there it sounded outrageous at the time but that interview with bob lazar turned area 51 upside down we coaxed a reluctant lazar into returning to las vegas to talk about it i don't know sometimes i really do regret it regret it and almost I, I almost feel like apologizing to him, saying that, you know, I'm sorry I let things out. Can I have my job back? My personal opinion, uh, based on comments I've gotten from uh, the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at CIA, would seem to indicate that Bob was perhaps an unwitting participant in a program designed to introduce someone with a technical background to some elements of the UFO research projects going on out at the test site. I have no doubts that Lazar actually was in a place where top secret investigations were going on. I'm not sure about all the details that have emerged from his account, but he certainly gives me the impression that he was actually there. Do I believe Bob Lazar? My answer to that is yes. And heck, it's going, it's going on uh, eight years that I've known him. His story has never changed. He wasn't in it for the publicity. He wasn't, surely wasn't in it for the money. He lost everything he had. Uh, I believe he's since, since totally sincere. As far as I can tell, he's a bright guy who t tells a great tale and who's told it often to people who have not checked on him, who accept the notion that, well, the government wiped his slate clean. Basically, I think uh, he had an experience. I think uh, he saw some things that shocked him, was subject to some conditions and experiences that were very unnerving to him and very profound.
he said you would love to see what's what's out there because it's like beyond science fiction he said and I wish I could talk to you about it but I can't and that's as close as he ever got to telling me anything that happened out there you'll find many people who have seen these discs question is where do they come from uh, Bob Lazar may be one of the few people who can tell us that they're from somewhere else I've no doubt that there's a relatively small number of people within the intelligence military intelligence and scientific and technical intelligence community who are aware of what's going on and an even smaller group who are actually organizing top secret research into this phenomenon. There's been an operating airbase out at the location known as Area 51 since the 1950s when it was home to the CIA's top secret SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. Then in the 1970s it became the test flight center for the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber. It's fairly public knowledge that we have a super secret facility uh, in the mountains uh, in northern Nevada uh, referred to as Groom Lake, uh, Area 51 of the uh, Nellis uh, Air Force Base test range. Uh, it's also been uh, referred to as, uh, as Dreamland. This is an area that has been known but officially denied for many decades. All of our super secret aircraft uh, have been developed and test flown out in this particular area. So it only makes sense that if you have something as sophisticated as a flying saucer and the related technology to that, th that would certainly be one of the prime locations you'd want to go. What you see is an ordinary looking Air Force base. It's, it's nothing to write home about, but because the government won't talk about it, everyone wants to see it. The military has never said there are no UFOs. It's never directly denied any of the Area 51 stories. It would have been so simple when these claims came out, these Papoose Lake claims, for the military to simply say, look, we have nothing there. They could take a few reporters to this area and show them nothing there. The military hasn't done it. The military has stonewalled. It has remained silent. And that's the most damning thing that they can do. Area 51 to this day is not acknowledged. That is to say the Air Force does not admit that it exists. This status has been maintained very carefully, particularly in the last few years. The puzzle is that the base has clearly been very active for quite a while and you can see that there are about uh, 700 to 1,000 people traveling from Las Vegas every day. So essentially the bulk of what has gone on there in the last 10 years um, has not emerged from the black. This airplane was, the program was terminated, the airplanes were put in mothballs for 20 years before they admitted the existence of the aircraft. There's programs that they're working on today that are 50 years ahead of anything that you and I can even conceive of, and that we may never, they'll ne may never see the light of day. Would you say it's America's most top secret military base? As far as a as far as an operational test facility, it's probably the most secret test facility in the free world, yes. So there is no question that the facility is there, that the government has said very little in the past about it. Now the real question, I suppose, is are there any flying saucers out there? No one had associated flying saucers with Area 51 until Bob Lazar's interview hit television screens around the world. 
He said that he worked at an underground facility called S4. The top secret project was codenamed Galileo. They would call at a specific time. For instance, the operator would say, Mr. Lazar, it's now 4.15 a.m. We expect you to be at McCarran Airport at 4.45. Your plane will be leaving at such and such time. I drive there, check in, board the plane, and the plane would fly out to Groom Lake. It would land there. I'd get off the plane and wait, and there would be a bus to take me and whoever else is going to uh, S4 Papoose Lake, which is about 15 miles south of there. And uh, then I would check in at S4. Tell me about how you felt on your very first trip out. The first trip out there it was uh, it was actually very exciting because it seemed so cloak and dagger to me, especially after I got in the bus with the blacked out windows. I, I kind of thought that was neat. Uh, drove out to the site and then uh, it was checked in, guards walking around with guns and uh, I, I was sure what I was working on was going to be pretty fascinating. He says that within a few days of working out at S4, he was shown an actual flying disc in one of the hangars. When I was brought in by bus, and for the first time, one of the hangar doors, the one on the end, was open. The bus drove up and we stopped there, and at clear as day in the hangar, taking up almost all the hangar, was the disc. Uh, looked like something right out of a science fiction movie. And as I walked in there, I thought, well, this is the new advanced aircraft we've been working on, and this is why people keep seeing flying saucers, because it's ours, and we've just been testing it probably for all these years. And what, what color and size was it? It was a uh, dull stainless steel, pewter gray, very uh, unimpressive color-wise about 52.8 feet in diameter and about 16 feet high. So was it actually a recovered craft that you were working on or was it one that um, scientists had built as a mock-up of, of a recovered craft? Well, whether it was recovered, given or what, it was not built as a mock-up. It, it was an alien craft built on another world. There was absolutely no doubt about that. Lazar claims that he was one of only 22 people who had something called majestic clearance to work on the craft itself. The whole aim of the project was to take these craft, or the one in particular that I was working on, and try and duplicate its systems and subsystems with earthly materials. The work that I did basically entailed back engineering the power and propulsion system. And I opted to start with the, uh, the power, the, the reactor that, that ran the craft. I knew immediately if his credentials could be verified, if even part of his story could be verified, it'd be one tremendous expose. George Knapp was a long-standing TV reporter. He'd heard enough of the UFO rumors over the years to appreciate how big a scoop this could be if Lazar was telling the truth. He gave me uh, uh, information about his background, educational background and employment background. I started with, uh, with his claim to have worked at Los Alamos Lab. We went to Los Alamos and uh, got nothing uh, even close to cooperation. Uh, they wouldn't uh, respond to our phone calls. They say we have no information on Bob Lazar. There's nothing in the files. I said, are you sure now? No, nothing in the files. I showed him uh, the, the phone book entry that Bob had kept that said, uh, 
he was there. I showed him the newspaper article that, that showed that he was there. Basically, uh, Los Alamos Lab um, tried to thwart me at every step. We're completely uncooperative in trying to get information about Bob, and I, and I found that to be the case at every step of the way in trying to verify his background. Former NASA mission specialist Bob Exler had heard about Area 51 and Groom Lake when he worked on the Apollo and Space Shuttle projects. He was intrigued by Lazar's claims and started to investigate. Uh, I did uh, a variety of research uh, relative to Bob Lazar. I actually met him. Uh, I obtained a copy of his, uh, what they call a W-2 form, which is one of the um, uh, IRS documents associated with, uh, with pay. Uh, his particular form indicated that he worked for the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Um, they informed me that it was a genuine document. It was not something that had been fabricated. There were a variety of numbers, uh, contract numbers and so forth, uh, issued on the document, which I was able to research, again, finding that uh, these were uh, highly classified uh, numbers. In fact, uh, Internal Revenue Service ran into a, a brick wall when it came to trying to track down uh, the actual employer uh, associated with the, with the document. And then again, with the Social Security Administration, we found that Bob Lazar's records had in fact been, been bleached clean. There was nothing there in spite of the fact that the document uh, clearly indicated that uh, Social Security taxes had been taken out of his pay. Not everyone who's researched Bob Lazar believes his claims. Stanton Friedman is one of the most respected authors in the UFO field today. He's a former nuclear physicist with top secret clearance and has many friends and contacts in the Black Project world. I've looked at considerable depth into Bob Lazar's claims, both about himself and about propulsion systems. Those are fairly elaborate claims. I've talked to the schools that he claims to have received degrees from. I've checked on his high school record. I talked to Los Alamos Lab where he was supposedly a scientist and so forth. I have come up totally empty. Now when a guy lies like that, you get very wary. And you know, it has all the trimmings, his story, of a Walter Mitty story somebody in his imagination was, you know, stronger, brighter, faster than anybody else. I don't doubt that he did some work at Los Alamos and other places. He's clever. He drives a jet-powered car, fixes radiation detectors. So he may have performed some service, but I can find no reason to think that he worked out there on a flying saucer. I mean, I had to wonder whether this guy was making this stuff up, but then I see the phone book and I see the newspaper article and I talk to people who worked with Bob at the lab and who said, in fact, that he did work on classified projects, yet no one can find any records of his background. The people that I worked with, colleagues, the people I went to school with, obviously knew I was there, uh, and people at Los Alamos, I was friends with and people that worked under me and alongside of me knew I was there and, you know, cooperate what was going on, but, um, you know, officially it's very difficult to get information for the people in charge. To further prove his claims, Lazar agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed. The thing that uh, is interesting about polygraph is that if you're embellishing or if you don't completely believe what you're saying, it is very, very easy to detect. Uh, all it really will tell you is that the individual believes with 100% conviction that what he's reporting is exactly as he recalls and as he believes it to be. And that clearly was the case with Bob Lazar. Now, could his perception have been 
a, a bit askew? Yes, that's possible. But he clearly wasn't lying. I think Bob is even open to the possibility that perhaps he had been used in some sort of misinformation or disinformation campaign. I mean, look at him. He has a pirate flag floating on his house. He races jet cars. He likes uh, fast women. He likes guns. Um, he w he's technically capable. So in that sense, he may be perfect for this kind of a program. Technically capable, scientifically knowledgeable, and yet uh, completely discreditable at a, at a moment's notice. If you wanted to uh, test public reaction to a story about Area 51 and then suddenly discredited afterwards, Bob may have been the most qualified person in the country. Lazar says that on one occasion he was escorted into the flying disc that he saw in the hangar to analyze its propulsion system. It was obviously made uh, to be piloted by something smaller than the average human being. Uh, very cramped in there. Um, what were the size of these seats that were in there? The seats were very small. I'd say about one-third to one-fourth the size of a normal human seat. A lot of people a lot of people say, boy, it must have been exciting to go in there, and I, and I always say it, it wasn't. It was a very ominous feeling. It, um, I know it sounds silly, but it, it, it's so unearthly in there. You have spoken to someone who's actually seen um, a UFO under a tarpaulin at Area 51. I have. Uh, I've, I've spoken to several people who've seen UFOs or disc-shaped craft out there. There was, a, there was a woman who was a secretary for a major defense contractor at the Nevada test site who worked on nuclear programs who told me that she had sat in on, on uh, conversations between military and civilian contractors at which the Roswell case had been discussed, at which it had been discussed taking some Roswell material to Area 51. Uh, the level of secrecy during those meetings was great. Afterward, they'd take the, the ribbons out of the typewriters she was typing on. She was ready to tell me about this, and I had this conversation with her on the phone. The next day after this conversation takes place, she's visited by two men who say that they work for the company she used to work for, reminding her that she is still under a security oath, told her, we know that you do a lot of traveling back and forth, a lot of long drives between Las Vegas and L.A. We'd hate for something to happen to you or your family. No interview. I mean, it happened again and again and again. Same scenario. Lazar says that in addition to being shown inside the disc, he actually saw it take off from the lake bed. I was brought into the hangar for one of the short duration tests and the craft was already outside on the lake bed and that was uh, pretty much of a marvelous sight. It's a huge thing. It, I, it's like seeing a house lift off the ground. You, you can't imagine the energy involved to do that. Because of the uh, extremely high energy output and the fact that the outside of the craft does is used as a conductor, that does ionize the air. And the crafts do as a byproduct of this glow at night, uh, much like a fluorescent tube will light up. So, you know, bright, strange jumping lights in the sky, that, that does explain that. Would you categorically say there is no way that, that humans could have built the craft that you saw? Absolutely, I will categorically deny that, well, I don't know, how exactly should I put that? I guess I can just say it straight out. There is, there is no way that any government on this earth could produce that craft, period. And I defy anyone to argue that point.
One of the big questions that's hung over this whole story is whether Lazar saw a man-made flying disc and not an alien spacecraft. A lot of these craft which are being developed in secrecy in, in the United States are tested at night. And one can imagine that seen through kind of half-closed eyes, something like an F-117 stealth fighter or a B-2 bomber, side-on or front-on, would look remarkably like, say, a flying saucer or a UFO. You see an F-117 or you see tacit blue um, or you see uh, a B-2. Particularly if you see it from some fairly unusual angle, you're going to have a very hard time relating that to conventional aircraft. Um, some of these things can look very strange indeed. Um, so, you know, an unusual but decidedly terrestrial aircraft um, can certainly present the appearance of a disc from many angles. I think for anyone who's, who's been out into the western United States and seen the kind of place it is and let their imaginations run riot a bit, it is possible to imagine in, its, in these vast test areas technologies which are highly exotic, highly uh, revolutionary and would change the way we feel about science today. However, to say that that is alien science derived from beyond this world, I think is something which is just, it is unbelievable. It's too much to, uh, to absorb. Do you think that some of the truth certainly lies out there in the middle of the Nevada desert at Groom Lake? I would expect that some of the truth may very well lie out in the desert near Groom Lake. It's the right place for some of it to be. It's isolated, it's under control, it's high security. I don't think we've yet scratched the surface on what's happening out there with regard to flying saucers. According to Lazar, the craft that they were secretly testing out in the desert at night used an exotic anti-gravity propulsion system. The reactor itself was an incredibly advanced system. This is, uh, was an antimatter reactor. This is something we could only dream of having, something that could put out huge amounts of power that rivals several nuclear power plants running at capacity. What happens is a great gravity distortion is created and you're essentially bending space toward the craft. The craft becomes part of that space and then when the reactors or when the gravity amplifiers are shut down, the craft is essentially where it was focused. It's a very difficult thing to grasp. It happens virtually instantaneously because of the fact that gravity distorts time and if you're bending space and time along with it when you wind back up in that place you're there between the ticks of a clock looking at uh, nighttime video films out in the uh, uh, test site area 
we've seen video of craft that were uh, luminous that would move across the sky as if it was uh, skipping a stone across water or, or sort of a sewing machine effect. What we see across the screen are a series of uh, lights, of dashes of light uh, as the object moves from point A to point B. Therefore, we are seeing uh, what you might call a shadow effect of the propulsion mechanism at work. Bob Lazar is not the only person who's come forward and claimed to have worked out at the base on flying discs. Former U.S. Marines test pilot Bill Uhaus worked out at Groom Lake and other top secret locations for more than 40 years, working for the Pentagon and civilian contractors on a variety of highly classified projects, including, he says, a flying disc recovered from a crash in Kingman, Arizona in May 1953. He said that he'd been cleared to do this interview and to discuss certain information, but asked us not to show his face. What were you actually working on out there? One of the things I worked on was a, a flying disc simulator. It was designed in New Mexico by a, a separate staff that uh, built it uh, in parallel with the actual craft that they were had intended to fly. The purpose of the simulator was to train pilots to, uh, to fly this strange, uh, strange looking craft. The simulator was a 10 meter round uh, disc. The skin was made of uh, boron uh, composite material not unlike uh, that you see on the F-117. How did you know how to build the simulator? There essentially there weren't any plans. The plans were generated as we constructed it. And it was a, there was a process there that, that took quite a while for, for us to even understand the concept way back in the 50s. Uhaus says that Lazar did work at Area 51. I think Bob is saying exactly what he knows, and I know a little bit about Bob uh, from a different standpoint than a lot of the people know and what's been written about him, but uh, uh, Bob Lazar is not lying as far as uh, his place and position and the activity he was involved with at the time, although some of it, you know, he couldn't recall, but there's a lot of reasons why Bob was hired, number one. You know, here's the thing. Take a guy like Bob, send him out there, you know, somebody said, you know, aliens, blah, 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 blah. You know, all of a sudden you're thinking about nine alien crafts. You know, they may have not been nine alien crafts. Bravo 70, 14, contact depart, check it out. Do you believe that the government has recovered alien spacecraft? I have no doubts whatsoever that the United States has actually recovered a number of extraterrestrial vehicles. And what do they do with them? I think that since 1947, there have been efforts to try and duplicate the technology, what is referred to as reverse engineering. And I don't know how far they've got, but some reports indicate that we've actually been test flying within a limited area, actual alien vehicles or terrestrial vehicles. United States vehicles which have been made using alien technology. Could these not just be military aircraft? Well, I think it's quite possible some of them are military aircraft. I've heard from very reliable sources, including a leading specialist on unmanned aerial vehicles, 
that we have developed some disc-shaped platforms for aerial reconnaissance, some quite small, maybe some larger, which are being utilized by the Americans and have been built by the Americans. That's 638 or Delta, Las Vegas Star, runway 1 on the left axis, in a position at all traffic crossing downfield. Thank you, sir, 8 Delta. Was it a, a hard secret to keep? It was a vir virtually impossible secret to keep, but I did play by the rules, and uh, it caused a lot of problems. It caused some problems in my family life. Uh, I mean, imagine being married at the time, and, uh, you know, you get a call, you know, perhaps at night, and uh, a strange voice on the phone, okay, you disappear, you can't tell your wife who it was on the phone, where you're going, and you come back, you know, sometime early in the morning. I mean, what is she going to think? Unaware of where he was going every day and being absent from home for long periods, Bob's relationship with his wife had deteriorated badly. This was seen as a potential security risk out at the base. My wife was having an affair with someone else, so they viewed that as a potential emotional instability and they no longer wanted me coming out until things were cleared up, either for it, you know, it, it to break up or heal or whatever, but they, uh, that's what to put the brakes on everything there. And did they then stop calling you? Did you get very frustrated about that? Yeah, then I began to wonder, boy, now they've given me all this information and everything's come to a dead stop, what's going on? And uh, that's when I began to be concerned, and then uh, that's when I began and said, you know, it's, now it's becoming important that some other people know what was going on. As the silence turned from days to weeks, he finally decided to tell his wife and closest friends just what he'd been doing. Were you aware of the security implications? I was quite aware of what could happen, but I was also aware that uh, these guys would go to any extent to keep their secret and certainly not have someone that was on the inside running around. And uh, I didn't think it was beyond them at all to make me disappear, whether, it, I mean, who knows, I know it sounds more like a movie, but uh, uh, I didn't think it was beyond their capability to, to kill me, just to stop the, uh, the word from getting out. Bob knew the test flight schedule for the discs and took his wife, his best friend, Gene Huff, and another friend, John Lear, out to the desert near the base on a Wednesday night in March 1989. Pick up stuff uh, if it's like overhead, like up in the air. Overhead, 300 miles. Jeez. So it could be anyone of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds military to me. Yeah, yeah. I bet you that's that's you what this know. is. We got. Oh. You see that? Whoa. Yeah. What was that? Did you see that light just come on over yeah, there? That just I was looking right at it. Yeah. Hey, let me check it out. Well, right above or was a meteor too. No, there's a steady light. No, it's a steady it's light that just came on. Any kind of, uh... No, this one right over the range here. It oh. wasn't there and then I was looking right yeah. there and it blinked okay. on. Very bright. That's brighter than a star. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, Doesn't look like landing there. lights. Interesting. Oh, okay, this nice changed course. course. Oh. White light? Yeah. Yeah, he's coming at us. What did you see when you were out there? Shortly after the flight time that I had recorded, um, uh, white light came up. Well, not a white light. It was actually more of an amber light. Uh, came up off the ground and hovered and then be doing, uh, began doing radical step maneuvers and 
darting from one side of the sky to the other, doing, doing some impossible flight characteristics. Do you think what you saw over the desert that night was an alien spacecraft? Could I identify it as an ET craft without Bob's help? No, it would have been a, and you know, like I said, an elliptically shaped saucer doing, you know, uh, just doing moves that we're not capable of, but I could not say that no, this wasn't some advanced Earth technology. I guess I'm not clear now, sir. We figured out what the problem is, and whatever that heading is, we're ready for it. That would be a UFO. It's not blinking, it's not conforming to any sort of FAA lighting regulations, and there you're looking at it. That's like a typical UFO. If it was red, it would be real typical because that's what most people report, is red lights like that that are solid colored. I don't think that's landing lights because it's curved already and we're still looking at it. Looks like he's curving back. Here he comes. That is a typical military UFO. There you go. This small group went back to see two more Wednesday night flight tests, but on the third trip, they were spotted, caught, and arrested. Bob was taken to Indian Springs Air Force Base and interrogated. That interrogation was about as intense as you can possibly get, right stopping short of shooting me in the head. What were they saying to you? Everything up to and including that, you know, we can absolutely kill you right now and there'd be no one looking for you at all. And I mean, they, they, uh, everything. They threatened my wife. They threatened to kill my wife. They, they'd stop. They said they'd stop at nothing. They said they thought they made that very clear. They couldn't believe that I had taken anyone out there to show them that, much less left with information like the uh, flight test data and uh, wanted to know what else I had said, who else I had told specifically. They were, uh, they were crazy, they really were. They were completely out of control. After this interrogation at Indian Springs Air Force Base, Bob says that he was put under constant surveillance by security personnel. His phones were tapped, his movements were monitored, and he often found his car followed by military helicopters. Worried about what might happen to him and angry about how he was being treated, he decided to hit back and approached a local TV station about an interview. I thought if I did an interview in silhouette, it would be kind of pushing back a bit. Uh, we're going to say, you guys stop, and not saying too much, but just saying enough just to, to let them know that hey, I'm pushing back a bit and then lay off or, you know, it's going to get worse. It was really the only thing I could do. Did you get any calls from the military or from former workers to say, what the hell are you doing? Right after the interview aired, Dennis Mariani, who was my supervisor, called and you know, all he said was, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And that was the end of the phone call. Um, that was the last, well, or at least second to last communication I had with him. And, um, you know, then I decided, well, you know, that's it. And uh, really just said everything that I had seen and done and just wanted to divorce the entire situation. Even now, more than 20 years later, the jury is still out on Bob Lazar and his claims about his work out at Groom Lake. It's a fascinating story which he's stuck to for more than two decades. And although many dismiss it as pure fantasy, the fact is that some of his credentials did check out. In addition, his former employers and even the tax authorities were caught covering up and refusing to release information on him. Why would they do that unless there was something to hide? One thing is for certain, if he is telling the truth, 
then we're all in for some shocking revelations in the decades to come. Is the government ever going to say, you know, we've been lying to you for 40 or 50 years? Not a chance. I believe they'd stage an event that is much more like what they do. They'll take a big cargo plane or C-130 or something, take one of the old discs that they've, uh, you know, analyzed time and time again or and finished with, go up to a high altitude and push it out the back and then go fly away and say, oh, look, the first disc has crashed. You know, here's a flying saucer. I mean, I, I can almost guarantee that's, that's the route they'd take. Certainly there are a lot of questions about Bob's background that have not been satisfactorily answered. But there's too much that Bob knows, I think, that couldn't be explained any other way. Uh, he knows about the layout of the base. Um, he know, knew about people who were involved in security checks. He knew when and where the test flights were going to take place because he took people out there three weeks in a row and they videotaped the tests. How did he know this stuff if he, in fact, did not have some kind of inside knowledge? Do you think he'd make a good uh, conduit of information? I mean, essentially a patsy. Yes, I do. I think it's quite likely that Lazar was set up perhaps to knowing that he would give out this, this information. It's likely to be a very long time before we discover uh, what is actually being done out of Groom Lake now. They seem to wait anything from 15 to 20 years or more uh, after something has been retired before they acknowledge its existence. This airplane was built, designed, almost 40 years ago. 40 years before that, the hottest thing flying was a Seversky P-35. 40 years before that, it was a balloon. So the technology, technology has not stood still. So it's a very good possibility that we are looking at man-made transportation for the 21st century. Uh, it's, it's been so hopelessly polluted uh, that I, I'm not sure we'll ever, we will ever get to the bottom of this story, and, and that's sad. I, I suspect that whatever was out there, discs, alien or not, um, had now been moved to some other location, and we may never find them again. There might have been reason 40 years ago to believe that people couldn't handle uh, the idea of alien visitation. I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, I think we're far more sophisticated now. Do you regret having screwed up at S4 and taking your friends there and blowing your security cover because you could still be working on UFOs today? Uh, yes and no. Yes, I, at times I'd like to uh, be able to go back in time and and played along with the game and not have done anything and, and perhaps to this day still be working on them because I did feel privileged and it was fascinating work once you can get around all the uh, you know oppressive military security uh, and you know maybe we would have stumbled on something and, and uh, yeah it would have been fascinating. Um, the craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left, to the right, and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. However, that was an extremely impressive test. Uh, Maybe to someone that really knows little about science or anything, that, that wouldn't be a whole lot. But you have to realize this craft was about 52 feet in diameter. I don't know exactly how much it weighed, but it weighed a lot. And uh, this was quite, quite a scientific feat, to lift something completely silently, under control, and uh, you know, perform a maneuver like that. The craft itself was, uh, I assume it was metal. It was cold to the touch, that's why I say it was metal. But it was a uh, brushed aluminum, actually just an unfinished stainless steel, not shiny uh, finish to it. 
had no seams. It was as if it was injection molded from one giant die. I was completely amazed. I, I can't really reflect on how it made me feel, but it, that was exciting. How would you define gravity? Could you describe in layman's terms its basic principles for us? Gravity is something difficult to explain because it's something that we essentially don't understand. It's just something that we can observe. Not much is really known about gravity. Uh, there are many theories about it, but they are just mainly theories. There's theories of gravitons, which allege that there, these are these subatomic particles that, that act like an attractive force like gravity that exchange between two pieces of matter. There is also a theory that gravity is uh, a form of wave, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, but basically, gravity is a force. It's, uh, it's, it's the attraction. It, well, it's the inherent property of matter to have gravity, a mutual attraction for each other. And that's it, it's basically all that we really know. Modern science current science right now identifies one gravity. It's one force in nature. Uh, apparently, through research it has for or information gained from one of the crafts they were researching there, uh, it, it appears that there are two different forms of gravity. One form works on an atomic scale on subatomic particles, holding pieces of matter, holding atoms themselves together. Uh, another works on a larger scale, the scale we're most familiar with uh, holding planets in orbit, holding ourselves to the ground, things of that sort. Because it produces a gravitational field, it, I, I wouldn't say the craft is invisible during the day. However, if you're under the craft, because of the way the gravity is being used, gravity bends time and space and it, it bends light. If you are looking underneath the craft or from certain vantage points, you will actually see what's above the craft. It's, a, it's really a trick of the way light bends under the influence of gravity. For instance, we can see stars that are behind the sun, that are blocked from our view by the sun. The reason we can see them is because the sun is a tremendous gravitational field and it's bending the light around it where we can see the star. Space, time, and gravity are all essentially interrelated. They all act on one another. Gravity bends space. Gravity also distorts time. When you vary one, you essentially vary the other two. Uh, if you, as an example, if you have a massive body, say a planet or, or something that's making a lot of gravity, producing a lot of gravitational waves, if you will, um, it distorts space. It bends space to it. It also slows down time. These things aren't theories. We know them to be true. Uh, we cannot artificially create this because we can't create gravity. Uh, but this is how they're all interrelated. His burden made him With traveling at the speed of light. There are several problems traveling at the speed of light. Uh, just a couple of them are the fact that as your speed increases, so does your mass proportionally. Uh, in other words, the more energy you put in to go faster begins to slow you down by the fact that it's converted into mass. Um, you have other problems like just traveling at such an extreme velocity, navigational problems, the fact that you might run into little tiny micrometeorites uh, at, at speeds like this, they would undoubtedly destroy your craft. There's just a, a, a whole host of problems that you're going to run into. Uh, just attempting to do something like that. Aside from the fact the amount of energy required to accelerate to the speed of light is uh, horrendous. Could you briefly describe Project Looking Glass and Project Sidekick for us? Project Sidekick was another project going on uh, with Galileo. Galileo was the project that I was involved in. Sidekick dealt with any of the weapon potential of the craft, whether or not the craft had a weapon in it or could it be used as a weapon, but it had something to do with some sort of particle beam uh, configuration where the gravity generator can be used as a lens to focus, focus a weapon of some sort, similar to the SDI device we were working on in the, uh, the 80s, but with the potential of a focusing device using the uh, gravity generator. And Project Looking Glass? 
Project Looking Glass dealt with the distortion, the fact that there's a time distortion. Essentially, looking back in time, and by that I do not mean looking back years ago to see the wagon train days. They're looking for distortions that are milliseconds in time. And what, what that was used for, I, I don't know. But that was uh, just observing the time, the, you know, the time distortion, time dilation phenomena, the craft in operation. What is element 115? Is it found here on Earth, or is it strictly an extraterrestrial material? 115 is strictly an extraterrestrial material. Uh, it probably occurs naturally in some other places, maybe other star systems. Uh, you know, some people not familiar with science or chemistry say, well, that's ridiculous. All the elements occur on Earth, you know. Uh, but that's not true. There are elements on the periodic chart that aren't found on Earth. I believe the Heavy Ion Research Lab in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, has reached element 112 recently. So 115 isn't, isn't that far away. And when they synthesize it, it's not like they're making a, a couple ounces of it. They're talking about one or two atoms of it. To make any usable quantity of a heavy element like that is virtually impossible. Element 115 is in the top of the reactor. And the base of the reactor apparently is a small, something similar to a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator. Uh, a particle is accelerated to high speed and then deflected up a small tube, and it's aimed at the 115. This transmutes the 115, uh, similar to the way we, we do that in a normal particle accelerator. Uh, this causes a, a reaction, a radiation emission that we really haven't seen before. Um, it produces antimatter. This antimatter is guided down a tuned tube and reacts with a gas. When matter and antimatter react, they convert to 100% energy. This energy is converted, heat energy, is converted to electrical power in the reactor itself. This is done through a, a thermoelectric converter and its electrical power is used to power other subsystems on the craft, though there is no wiring, you know, as we would know it. Uh, also, that's almost a byproduct of the reactor. The reactor also sets up a gravitational wave from the 115 being bombarded. This gravitational wave was present at the top of the reactor and is essentially guided in the same way microwaves are guided through tuned tubes. And uh, this goes to their amplifying cavities and through the projectors that are in the bottom of the craft. With the gravity generators running, is there thermal radiation danger to the crew? There is no thermal radiation while the reactor is running. The thermionic generator is 100% efficient, which is in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But in fact, it works. Element 115 is stable. And for those familiar with chemistry, we know that uh, elements with higher atomic numbers have shorter and shorter half-lives. Um, however, when you reach a certain point, they call it the island of stability. There is a place, and we've theorized this for a long time, somewhere around 114 to 116, there should be an area in there where the nucleus of the atom is geologically stable with protons and neutrons, where it, it no longer decays. It's not radioactive. 115 is, in fact, this element. In fact, it does occur again, somewhere around element 247. Uh, of course, you know, we're nowhere near synthesizing that. We can only you know, predict things like that. But uh, that's, that's where 115 is. Did they, the aliens, give us element 115 in large quantities? Whether or not it was given to us I, I can't answer that question. However, I was told that we have 500 pounds by one of my coworkers. Uh, how it was obtained and you know where exactly it came from, I don't know. Whether it came in one of the crafts or you know it was separate cargo somewhere, you know, anyone can speculate. But I was I was told that was the the figure. You were able to get away with a sample of Element 115. How much did you get away with? No comment. The several nighttime test flights unofficially while off the base. What did you see? 
The test flights I saw off the base, actually the, the best test flight was witnessed by my friends who I had brought out there. I, at the uh, exact moment the craft was hopping around and doing some really impressive maneuvers, I had turned around and I think was uh, looking for the video camera or, or something to that effect. But I missed some of the most uh, impressive maneuvers. But the craft was uh, similar to what was done before that I had seen close up, other than the fact that it went above the mountain range, uh, moved a, a much greater distance at a much higher rate of speed. How were you able to find out about the test flight schedules? The test flight schedules were told to me, uh, specifically because I was probably going to have to be present during those times. And at that time, the test flights were taking place on Wednesday nights. And from what they said, that was because that was uh, statistically the least amount of traffic in the area. And that's uh, all that they were concerned about. Does the propulsion system release any sort of discharge or exhaust? There was a high voltage discharge on the bottom of the craft, but uh, as far as there being an exhaust, there was none. Why did they appear as glowing balls of light in the night sky? Well, that's kind of the same reason why a neon light or a fluorescent light lights up. What you're dealing with, with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. And uh, I don't think it's anything, it, it's a really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light. The same reason why lightning is visible. You have a huge electrical discharge, and the gas emits light in the form of lightning bolt. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or uh, just a bright light in the sky from a distance, uh, even close up you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. Uh, this is typically what you'd see in your normal UFO sighting, uh, if you've heard them a lot. However, keep in mind that lights in the sky are caused by much more common things than flying saucers. Tell us a little more about the aurora you witnessed taking off out of Area 51. It was a large craft, and the one glimpse I got of it was from the rear, and it had two huge square exhaust with veins in them and uh, it was just it sounded more like a rocket than a jet I don't know I even think he did mention that it was liquid methane powered but um, there again you know working on the disc technology I really could care less what was rolling around at area 51 but uh, it, it, it did catch my eye as a result of going public have there been any attempts made on your life one day when I was getting on um, Interstate 15, driving down Charleston Boulevard, uh, a car came up alongside of me, and uh, I thought he was just trying to race me to get on the freeway. Uh, this was after I had left the project. Um, it was a white, boxy-looking car, exactly what make and model, I don't know. But um, I accelerated to get on the freeway to go fast and there was a gunshot and the back of the car was hit and I skidded off into the uh, median and I stopped and I was frightened and I just stood there because I thought the guy was going to be alongside of me and just shoot me. I had nothing to do. I was essentially paralyzed with, with fear and I waited there and then nothing else happened. And do I know it was a government agent trying to kill me? No. Could it have been a drive-by shooting? Maybe. Uh, you know, so it wasn't, I mean, it was an attempt on my life, but by who specifically, I, I don't know. Though I was threatened uh, before I had left. That they threatened my wife's life and my life, so I can only put two and two together and say that they were kind of pissed at me. In an earlier interview, you had mentioned that they had put a gun to your head. Tell us about that. That was after we were caught out when I had the test flight schedule, and uh, I brought some friends out to show them the disc test. Uh, we got caught out there, and the following day I was debriefed down at Indian Springs Air Force Base. And um, 
I was in the room with the security guards that caught us, my supervisor and some other people and uh, some of the security personnel. Uh, yeah, they were essentially grilling me about security and, you know, how could I possibly bring people out there and uh, I guess I wasn't as responsive as they would like and they got in my face and wanted to pull the sidearm out and you know, just pushed it against me. Have you maintained any contacts with your colleagues out at S4? No, I never heard from anyone other than for a very brief time after I left, Dennis, who was my supervisor, did try and make contact with me at the, uh, the meeting place was the Union Plaza Hotel. And I took a, a friend of mine, Gene Huff, down there and another friend, uh, a former colleague and scientist from Los Alamos. And we did, uh, we saw him, but I also did recognize some security personnel walking around there from S4. So whether or not it was a setup or what was going on or who was trying to talk to me, we never found out and we left. It just was a, a real strange situation. I never heard from him since. As we enter the 21st century, how has your experience changed your beliefs? Well, if you want to word the question, how are my opinions changed? Uh, I would say considerably. And before I was at S4, I was more or less one of the uh, one of the guys that thought, you know, all these government conspiracy and UFO buffs and things like that were complete lunatics. Um, I even remember before I was involved there, a friend showed me a little newspaper clipping and said John Lear was giving a lecture who was uh, touting that aliens from another world came to Earth and there's 70 different species. And I remember laughing on the phone that this guy had lost his mind. And uh, I was also under the impression that, you know, boy, the government's all for the people and they, you know, you know, they're out here to protect us and all that. And, you know, after the experiences I had there, uh, everything is completely turned around. You know, the, the government <laughs> is doing everything but uh, looking out for us. I mean, the only thing they're looking out is for themselves. You know, uh, obviously the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if in fact that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others crafts and technology from another world and uh, that's probably the most important event in history. It kind of moved from science fiction into reality in my mind and uh, it really just I guess opened my eyes. Let's go! Whether or not we can duplicate them. I mean, if we can understand what a device is or how something operates or what its physical makeup is that's great but if we can't duplicate it it's useless to us. So there's really two phases to the project going on there. It's understanding what we're looking at and then once we understand it is can we duplicate it with earthly materials and earthly technology and you know unless we've got a handle on both of them all that technology is useless to us and, and if it turns out we can't do that all we have is one single prized possession that we have to take care of and that's it. After all that's been said and done, would you do this over again? What would you do differently? I would probably have played along for a longer time. Um, I would like to have known a little bit more about the technology and uh, probably kept quiet if I could have. Um, and possibly never have said anything. Uh, I almost wish I had done that, you know, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really only caused headaches and problems, but um, I believe if I was given the opportunity again to go back in time and redo it, I think I pretty much would have just shut up and gone along with the program. I would have much preferred that instead of the Navy or whoever it was, uh, that hand-picked a few renegade scientists here and there, that they turn it over to some more qualified people. Obviously, I was not the most qualified person on propulsion or field propulsion or anything of that sort. I was just some guy. I mean, they could have picked, I could have named 10 or 12 other guys that were more qualified than me. But um, 
you know, if they turned it over to the scientific community and not just a couple guys here in the United States, I mean, you need a large group of people in a large lab to research what's going on there, uh, not a little quiet installation. It's the, it's the security itself that prevents them from getting anywhere. I mean, it, it, they never do work hand in hand. You can't have a, a military mind. Science itself must communicate. You have to have a free exchange of ideas. That's how things progress. And when you clamp down on a security system like that, where you work in isolated groups and ideas cannot be exchanged, you don't get anywhere. And that's, that's the problem they have. What does the future hold for Bob Lazar? Well, I'm not really involved in any of that stuff anymore. That's kind of put behind me. Um, I have my own businesses that I work at, uh, some computer graphics, uh, some consultation, um, other technical jobs, uh, radiation detectors, and a few other things like that. Um, so really, I just go about my life, and that's you know something that happened that was fantastic, and, and it's over, but uh, it's kind of hard to shake it loose. But eventually I will, and that'll be that. I think all the surveillance and everything stopped. I don't think anyone's bothering to monitor me. I've, I've said everything that I know. It's been all over the place, so it's kind of uh, a done deal. As far as whether or not there are any craft out there, I believe you know they were out and gone in probably the late 89, early 90. And the only thing people see now out there are you know, either flares or planes coming into land. But uh, that's about it.